AI can give you an answer, but it can't necessarily explain why things are the way that they are or, or understand the surrounding context. And so that's really where, you know, again, when we think about the opportunities for AI and human intelligence to kind of be combined and work together, that's really where the optimism comes as opposed to, hey, this AI is basically just a machine version of a human that's going to come in and do everything that we do and, and take all of our jobs away. I am Reese Tisdo. This is The Future of Water, which we talk about all the ways which companies, utilities, and people are addressing the challenges and opportunities in water. This is episode 92, and I know it's going to be a good one. That's because I'm joined today by Bluefield Senior Research Director, Eric Bindler. I want to talk to Eric because he's been on the road talking about artificial intelligence in the construction sector. Uh, this includes water and wastewater utilities. The public launch of OpenAI's ChatGPT in November of 2022 really set off a wave or tsunami of conversations about the impacts and applications of AI and related technologies across a range of industries and economic sectors. Sure, AI in many cases, it's a buzzword in many respects, but at the same time, it's and it's while grabbing the headlines over the last 12 to 18 months, there are real applications and uh, impacts that are unfolding before us. This includes water and wastewater. You know, within that includes jobs and includes processes and includes efficiencies and just sometimes just operations of of physical plant. So in the U.S. utility construction sector, it's already, you know, facing chronic labor shortages amid historic levels of, of federal infrastructure investment. So AI can serve as a powerful tool for productivity, efficiency and safety. Like I said, and Eric is going to talk a fair amount about that in the discussion I hope that I'm about to have with him. But uh, in the wake of his presenting, you know, this all comes in the wake of his presenting to the National Utility Contractors Association, NUCA, I believe it was in Palm Springs about a week ago. So I wanted to tap his brain, see if he'd share some of those insights with you. So, and I can assure you there's lots of good stuff that will be discussed with with Eric. So, but before we do that, I thought I'd share some news that caught my attention this past week. At the end of March, that is March 2024, Georgia lawmakers finally gave final passage to a change in state law that would allow a private utility to provide water services for new homes near Hyundai's upcoming electric vehicle and battery plant uh, just west of Savannah. The measure now goes on to Governor Ryan Kemp to be signed into law. I think the expectation is that it will be signed into law. Hyundai had broken ground in October 20. 22 on its first U.S. factory um, producing EVs and the batteries that power them. Uh, it's the largest economic development project in Georgia's history. Constructions move pretty quickly for the South Korean automaker. So given the significance of it to the local economy, to the state as a whole, supporters of the bill said legislation is needed to accelerate some of the home constructions that are affiliated or needed to house some of the workers uh, in Bryan County where the Hyundai plant uh, is intended to employ 8,500 workers uh, for the $7.5 billion plant, um, like I said, west of Savannah. So as a result, Savannah Water Utility Management, which is a private company that supplies drinking water to 32,000 homes in 17 Georgia counties, has pushed to pass the bill. They're the ones who are going to own and operate this uh, water treatment facility. So why do we care? Well, the passage of uh, Georgia House Bill 1146 highlights really the complex interplay between state regulations, local government authority, and private sector involvement in water service provisions. So there's a lot to be said there. So one, at Bluefield, we're always interested in state policies that are driving or inhibiting private participation in water. Does this open the door to a state that has been relatively quiet when it comes to investor and utility participation? Or is this really about, you know, is this a one-off to support the Hyundai facility? So I think that is interesting. The other part of it is local government authority. So the local government authority, in this case, the county has been superseded or its authority has been superseded almost by the state, who the state is really interested in economic development that benefits everybody uh, within the state because of tax bases and jobs, et cetera. And it looks really great economically, but for how long is that going to play out? 
I mean, usually we're talking about competition for water in places like California, whether it be Southern California or Arizona or Colorado, Colorado River Basin, you know, competition for water among agriculture and industry and uh, domestic uh, you know, household residences. So, and you, that's in the West typically, but in the East, there is a real water problem. And so the local communities are, are concerned about this. Agriculture is a big base, but they also have their own water needs. And, you know, I know, like I said, when we look at the Eastern US or the Eastern seaboard, we typically don't think about water risk, but there is a real problem. It makes me think about a couple of years ago when Bluefield Research did some analysis for the Water Reuse Association, where we did some regional profiles looking at different regions of the U.S. and what are the drivers and inhibitors to alternative water supplies, such as recycling, treating uh, wastewater, so what we would call water reuse. And one of the bigger issues in the eastern seaboard in a place like Savannah or western Savannah is they're using aquifers for their drinking water and water usage. But if it's overdrawn, as we've seen in other parts, then there can be saltwater intrusion, which can impact the quality of the water supplies and create bigger problems. We've already seen that happening in Florida. We're seeing it happening in, that would be Eastern Virginia. And we've also seen it in places like uh, Long Island, so or in, in New York. So it's a significant problem that raises a lot of issues uh, when it comes to water management. So therefore, I uh, have not seen the designs of the Hyundai facility and what they're, you know, I know how much they're drawing down or expected to use, and they've got permits for four different wells in an adjacent county, and they're working on that. But, you know, what, we don't want this to be as a tragedy of the commons um, where everybody gets access to it. Uh, the local authority is overlooked in its uh, insights. I thought that was interesting news. So like I said, role of private participation in Georgia, interesting uh, competition for water among different stakeholders in Georgia uh, or the rest of the US, definitely very interesting applications for new technologies, alternative water supplies, also very interesting, all coming together just west of Savannah. So if you're interested in this, let us know and one of our analysts can always jump on a call to talk to you about it. So with that being said, we'll get to Eric and talk a little bit about uh, AI and what's happening in the construction industry. All right, I'm joined here by Eric Bendler. Eric, welcome back. How's it going? It's good. It's been a been a busy week, but looking forward to the weekend. How about you? Uh, pretty good. I'm not going to, I mean, we were just talking about some interesting conversations we've been having about sort of the state of the world, elections, the water, wastewater sector. So yeah, I'm for everybody to know, it's Friday. So uh, <laughs> this is it for us. But uh, this is it. Exactly. So why don't we uh, why don't we get into it? So is in the intro, I let everybody know that obviously I was talking to you, but also the fact that you have been looking at artificial intelligence, its role in the construction industry, but also water wastewater and what all of this uh, noise, real or unreal, might mean. So. What I was hoping to do is have you kind of uh, share some thoughts from some presentations you've been making, but also some of your research as well. So I uh, feel like, you know, like every day I open the newspaper, which I still do. I'm, I'm old school. I do open the paper paper and uh, I read about AI and all the disruption that's happening. And since the rollout of ChatGPT, water sector is also either jumping on the bandwagon or thinking about getting on the bandwagon, but it's everything from angst to opportunism uh, when we look at it. So can you maybe put some of this buzz in perspective, why the water wastewater sector is talking about it? Yeah, it's definitely been a topic of conversation in a lot of places. I mean, uh, just a couple months ago, I was at the the utility management conference in Portland and, you know, I'd say at least every like panel slot, you know, if there were maybe five or six panels going on concurrently, at least one of them was about AI or, or kind of digital data more broadly, but especially AI, like it was a, it was a really hot topic of conversation. Companies are talking about it. Utilities are talking about it. Investors are talking about it. Um, I, you know, had the opportunity to talk about it myself at the, the NUCA, uh conference in Palm Springs a couple of weeks ago. So that's the National Utility Contractors Association, more of a, you know, kind of a construction market crowd. And so, a lot of this is actually more geared towards 
utility contractors and, and construction firms as opposed to utility operators themselves. And so it was a bit of a different crowd and a bit of a different kind of a topic to, uh, for me to think about from kind of a digital water perspective, but um, really interesting nonetheless. And, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do for my, my slides, I was asked basically to give a presentation on the state of AI and kind of applications of AI in the construction sector. And the first thing was kind of, how do we put some sort of numbers or, or, you know, framework around understanding how big this thing is, right? I mean, again, it is, there's a lot of buzz around it, um, especially since, the emergence of ChatGPT back in, you know, late 2022. And so it was kind of like, you know, you Google how big is the AI market or how fast is it, gro is it growing? And you're going to see all kinds of crazy projections and stats out there and and um, estimates. You know, I think there was some, I don't remember if it was Deloitte or, or somebody else um, that had put out, you know, estimates for AI is going to add 7% to US GDP. You know, these these really big numbers that are at this point, I think very hard to quantify. But what I wanted to do was look at you know, what we've seen in terms of growth so far, right? Like looking at kind of actual reality in and the past as, as instead of projections. And so two interesting stats that I thought were kind of, you know, powerful and and uh, and helpful for this were basically um, were this. So the first one was uh, looking at the time it's taken different technologies and different platforms to reach their first, uh, their first 1 million users, right? And so it's, you know, this, you can find a couple different versions of this type of data out there. But, you know, Netflix, for example, when it launched kind of the streaming platform in, in 1999, took three and a half years to reach a million users. Facebook, when it launched in 2004, took 10 months to reach a million users. The iPhone in 2007 took about 74 days. And ChatGPT, which is really, you know, the, the, the kind of first really mainstream AI platform or application out there, five days to reach a million users, right? And and so really, really quick growth in terms of just, you know, the the spread and the adoption um, to date. Now, you know, again, it's a free platform. It's not necessarily dollars spent, but but it does give you some indication as to just how, how quickly this thing has taken off. Our colleague Amber did a blog, I think last year on the impact of artificial intelligence on, on water use and data center spending and things like that. And, and she put in there, she had found a stat that, so yeah, ChatGPT launched November, 2022, a million users within five days. By August of 2023, so less than a year later, ChatGPT had 1.4 billion site visits in the month of August 2023 alone. Right, so we're talking like pretty pretty rapid acceleration of kind of of growth and and of usage. The other interesting number that I found was in kind of the venture funding space, thinking about just the the investment that's going into this market. You know, broadly, obviously not just in the water sector, but but kind of across the economy. And so that was that. In 2023, about a quarter, more than a quarter of all uh, venture funding for U.S. startups went to AI-based startups, right? And the, the percentage for the prior five years was something more like, you know, 10 to 12, maybe 15%. So again, really, really rapidly scaling investor interest in this technology. And then if, you know, you kind of compare that to the public markets and kind of the rise of NVIDIA over the past several months, right? This company that makes processors for, for AI has skyrocketed to become the third most valuable company in the world behind um, Apple and Microsoft, right? So that, you know, to give you a sense of kind of the public investor side of it and and how much how much money is going into this, how, much, how, many, how many dollars are kind of being put behind this. So all of that is to say, you know, yes, there is a lot of hype around this, but, but you know, to some extent, there, there's there's some pretty um, significant numbers and growth and acceleration to to justify that hype. The last piece I'll throw out, as much as I was just saying, you know, that we shouldn't think about the forecast and we should think about what's actually happened. We, of course, have our own view as far as you know AI applications within the water sector, and so this was another kind of visualization that I put together for the the Nuka presentation. 2024 market size, U.S. water, wastewater, capex, and opex, 177 billion dollars, growing at about a two percent compound annual growth rate throughout the rest of the decade, right? So pretty slow, you know, a, a large market, but but not very fast moving. The digital water market uh, within that about $8 billion. So a pretty small sliver of the total pie, uh, growing at about an 8% compound annual growth rate. And then we've also tried to just identify um, AI powered or AI enabled technology segments and products within the digital water market um, and that's something like, you know, $400 million. So, you know, pretty small sliver of even just the digital water market, let alone the the, the entire water wastewater market. 
um, growing at about a 14% compound annual growth rate, right? So that gives you a you know, sense of kind of the scale here. It is still a very small piece of, of, of overall activity in, in kind of the water wastewater utility sector. But, you know, a 14% growth rate equates to something like a doubling every four to five years, right? And so that level of change and and growth is is pretty uncommon for the water industry. And, and I think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. There's a lot of implications for jobs, which we'll get into. And and again, so, you know, it's it's a real phenomenon. It's still small, but but it is real. It is it is growing quickly, and it is important to to talk about whether you're a utility or a contractor or you know a, a vendor that's that's kind of serving the industry. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, from angst, optimism, or opportunism, um, you know, there are opportunities because of this. And so, you know, as you were mentioning, you were you were presenting at Nuka. Uh, when when most people think of construction, they're thinking about pick shovels, bulldozers, uh, pushing dirt, and uh, and laying water wastewater pipe in the ground. But AI doesn't immediately come to mind when they're thinking of that. In fact, up until now, they haven't thought about it probably at all. But to get everyone on the same page, can you define AI? Maybe even like what is it, and maybe what is it not? Yeah, I mean, this was really how I kind of kicked things off at Nuka. This was really part of what I was asked to do is just, you know, this is a crowd that you're absolutely right, is is usually thinking more about picks and shovels and bulldozers and not necessarily, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, the most kind of cutting edge technology. So it was just to level set, you know, can we put some basic kind of, you know, user friendly definitions out there? And so found a couple ways of thinking about this that I thought were helpful. I mean, the first point to mention is that, you know, AI itself, artificial intelligence is, it's kind of an umbrella term, right? It refers to a, a range of different techniques and technologies um, that have manifested themselves in different ways in different products that people are using or in different, different solutions, right? So I'll just define, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few out there, but I'll define a couple that I think are kind of the most maybe commonplace or the most relevant to this conversation. And the first would just be kind of AI itself. I mean, this actually, this this definition, kind of stealing it from um, the, we, we actually put out a white paper on AI in the water sector way back in 2019, I think, with Arcadis. <laughs> so pretty pretty early days in terms of this discussion. But so shout out to Jim Cooper from, from Arcadis for this one. But um, his, his way of saying this is basically artificial intelligence is the ability of machines to sense, reason, engage, and learn in a manner that seems intelligent, which I think is a really kind of succinct and, and powerful kind of definition there. Within that, you get you get to things like machine learning, right? That's another really common kind of subset of AI that basically involves enabling machines to learn and improve based on data or experience without being explicitly programmed in terms of, of what to do. And so that's kind of the classic example of you know, essentially um, trying to teach a machine to identify a cat, you know, a picture of a cat not by telling it what a cat is, but by giving it a bunch of pictures of cats and letting it kind of work out what the common features are and how a cat is different from a dog and things like that, right? So, you know, just feeding the feeding the the algorithm, feeding the machine with enough data that it it learns the patterns to to identify uh, one thing versus another thing, right? Um, and then generative AI is kind of the third key term here that is really kind of has really come into the fore. Um, with the chat GPT and the, the open AI conversation and, and generative AI basically is artificial intelligence that builds, you know, uses machine learning to create brand new content, right? That can be text, it can be code, it can be images, it can be videos, it can even be music um, in response to a user generated prompt, right? And so something like a chat GPT, basically, you know, it's trained on just massive, massive, massive amounts of text-based data from the open internet to be able to produce human like text you know you can ask it questions but it doesn't necess- it's not just about giving you the answer finding the answer but 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 creating text in the format that you ask it so you can ask it to you know write you an essay or a term paper you can ask it to write you some lines of code you can ask it to write a poem actually one of the, one of the guys in the nuka audience was talking about how he had used it to write a love poem for his wife right so you can you can have this you know it it understands not just content but also kind of style and 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 tone which is really interesting and so that's kind of where we're at with this you know the chat conversation is is that that piece of it the generative ai kind of creating new content so that's kind of what ai is i think the other piece of it that i was really interested in talking about was kind of what what ai isn't right and and really a lot of that comes down to and and the place that i wanted to take that conversation is the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence, right? You know, the the kind of um, 
the understanding at this point is that we're kind of in a place with AI, with kind of the overall development of AI. It's called narrow artificial intelligence, right? So people have been successful in designing specific AI programs or applications or algorithms to do very specific things, right? Whether it be something like a chat GPT or, you know, a, a, a treatment plan optimization algorithm or, or what have you, we're not at a place where there's a, an AI program that that has kind of reached something that would be like on, on par with human intelligence and especially the 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 diverse set of skill sets and 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 knowledge and kind of functions that the human mind or the human brain can perform, right? That would be something called you know artificial general intelligence. And we're still, you know, years, if not decades away from that. The next step, the thing that's really kind of the scary, you know, sci-fi futuristic thing would be artificial super intelligence, where AI, AI is actually kind of smarter than or, or or you know more powerful than the human brain. But there are still these really important differences between like what AI is good at and what humans are good at. And that really gets to the conversation that we'll get into in a minute about kind of the workforce implications, right? But, you know, AI can process really large data sets really quickly. It's really good at identifying patterns and trends, making predictions, you know, spotting kind of anomalies or discrepancies in these massive amounts of data that that a, that a individual human would just not be able to kind of process or make sense of in any any meaningful way. And then there's the kind of the absence of human error or fatigue that you get with with people, right? You can you can ask an AI, you can ask an algorithm to do these really complex calculations, to do these repetitive tasks, and it's not going to need a break. It's not going to need to go to sleep. It's not going to it's not going to make the same kind of human errors that um, that you know that that kind of a human operator might be able to make. There's also the opportunity for really kind of you know because because AI can work at such a such a great scale the opportunity for really kind of personalized output, right? So if you think about the classic like Spotify or YouTube, where essentially um, by by processing all of the data on the decisions that you've made within that platform, the songs you've listened to or the songs you've skipped, for example, and comparing your behavior with, you know, millions of other users that are kind of doing the same thing, it can make recommendations about, oh, you know, if you like this artist, you might like this artist and get down to that really personalized level in a way that would be really tough for, you know, an individual person to do. But, you know, there's still uh, there's a big difference between that and what, a, you know, the kind of the human mind is maybe best suited for and the strengths that humans still have, you know, far and above what what AI is even close to to being able to do. And that would be in areas like, you know, empathy and emotional intelligence, creativity, you know, being able to make decisions based on things like ethics and norms and, and morals and, and even just kind of understanding common sense. Right. AI can give you an answer, but it can't necessarily explain why things are the way that they are or, or understand the surrounding context. And so that's really where, you know, again, when we think about the opportunities for AI and human intelligence to kind of be combined and work together, that's really where the optimism comes as opposed to, hey, this AI is basically just a machine version of a human that's going to come in and do everything that we do and, and take all of our jobs away. I mean, I can tell you what it shouldn't be doing is writing love poems to your wife. But, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you got in trouble for that one, but it was a pretty funny story. For them. I don't know if I'd uh, announce that to a crowd, let alone my family or my wife. But um, well, why? <laughs> good grief. Um, well, with that being said, um, and super helpful because there is a lot to unpack. I mean, one of the big controversies or at least that everybody talks about when it comes to AI is its potential impact on jobs, right? So you've come across some really interesting data on this um, and, and applied it to construction and or we've started talking about water wastewater. So can you provide some color on this and what it might mean for types of jobs impacted and so on? Yeah, I, I found this really interesting analysis actually from Goldman Sachs or some economists at Goldman Sachs on, yeah, basically just trying to understand what the potential impact of AI could be on different types of occupations. And so I, you know, unfortunately, since it's a podcast, I can't kind of show you the the slide, but if you're a client, definitely come check it out. We've got the Nuka slides on our website. I'm happy to kind of share this one around because it's it's super interesting. But basically the idea is that they looked at, I think, 900 different occupations, like not necessarily jobs, right? So it's not in terms of number of people, but it's 900 different occupations that people have in the US economy. And they tried to kind of model out the 
what percentage of, of that person or that occupation's kind of daily workload, what their tasks associated with that occupation, they try to figure out what percentage of that workload could be offset or, or exposed to AI in some way, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're a market researcher and you spend part of your day, you know, answering client emails and part of your day uh, doing research into new topics, right? Which of those tasks could potentially be taken over by an AI? And, you know, how does that vary for different types of jobs, you know, a, a market researcher or, a, uh, you know, a construction worker or a, an investment banker, right? So what they found was that basically the, the first, you know, it's about the first 40 or so percent of occupations, the kind of least exposure occupations basically have really no or very minimal exposure to AI. Then you get into this kind of middle range of about 57% of occupations where something like a quarter to half of the daily workload could be offset by AI, right? So a significant portion, but not, not, uh, not the majority, right? And that's where you kind of get into these conversations about AI being able to free up the time that you're spending on some of these more mundane, more manual, more data related tasks and, and allowing for some of the stuff that's more human, right? The, the creativity the the critical thinking the kind of um, emotional and social intelligence interacting with people right the stuff that that maybe is is higher value in a lot of contexts and a lot of businesses um that's kind of the interesting conversation there and then really the top five percent is the piece that's maybe a little bit in trouble right that's where you're saying seeing about more than half of the workload potentially being offset or automated by ai those are the types of positions where yeah there may actually be some job losses or people needing to kind of be reskilled and, and retooled and, and move into new types of occupations. But I thought that was a really interesting way of thinking about it. That again, you know, for the biggest the biggest chunk of this of the of, of occupations, again, fifty seven percent right in the middle. You know, there will be some exposure. There's there's some opportunity for productivity gains and for freeing up some of that time and bandwidth to to potentially do kind of more higher value. Do you know to, to spend more time on the other. 50 to 75% that's maybe more valuable, that's that's more creative and that's more kind of, you know, human and relies more on human intelligence. So that's kind of the top line. And then when you translate that to construction, it's really interesting, right? Because really construction is very much on the lower end of the scale for, for the most part. And so um, here I basically looked at kind of, I think it's about 12 or so, 12 to 14 or 15 kind of high level, like Bureau of Labor Statistics classifications for jobs within the construction industry. And actually this, this one was specific to utility construction as opposed to other types of construction. And so as, as you can imagine, you know, the vast majority of people that work in the construction industry are construction workers, right? So people that are involved in construction or extraction activities, um, it's like about 50 something percent of the total workforce. That's a pretty low exposure to AI. You know, there are some interesting applications that we'll talk about for like improving worker safety and things like that. But, you know, we're not anywhere near a point where AI is going to like build a building or build a, a, a utility pipe or build a water treatment plant, right? We're not, we're not there. The next big chunk is installation and maintenance and repair type jobs. That's, um, you know, that is another probably 15 to 20 percent of, of the utility construction sector in terms of workers. Um, and that's also pretty low exposure. Again, you know, similarly, an AI is not going to be able to, to maintain or repair a pipe or a treatment plant. Right. But then you start to get into the back office type functions, right? You know, office and administrative support management, you know, business and financial operations, architecture and engineering sales those types of roles actually do have quite a bit of higher exposure to AI. And so that's that's where you're kind of seeing a lot of the potential um, applications here. It's not necessarily using AI on job sites, although there, there is a bit of that, but it's much more, you know, using AI for um, expediting or, or facilitating or improving, you know, the kind of uh, scheduling process, the estimating process, the uh, the design process, the project management stuff, right? And so that's that's really where a lot of the opportunities are, and and um, and I think speaks to, yeah, just the different types of skill sets that are really part of the the utility construction sector. So yeah, I mean, I think so, I mean, as you talk through this, I mean, I'm sort of thinking about you know those can work from home and those cannot. You know, if you work from home, there's a high likelihood that uh, you are exposed or we are exposed. Uh, whereas if you're, you know, if you're digging ditches, someone's got to do it. There's no one, there's no AI that can really go do that. And so skilled craftsmen and such, you know, maybe in the design and engineering, that's where um, applications can obviously take place. But within the construction industry, I know you were meeting with some of these people. 
are they using AI? I mean, what's the, what's the uptake of artificial intelligence within, within the construction sector? Yeah. So, so this is, this is a really interesting piece of it as well. I mean, you know, it's kind of digging around for just some kind of state of the industry survey type data to get a feel for what are the big issues that the construction industry in the U S is, is facing, you know, utility construction, but also just more broadly. And when you kind of map it out, a lot of it is stuff that AI could potentially help offset, right? So I've got, again, another great chart here that if you're a client, definitely go on and check this one out. But the top three concerns for the for construction firms right now are all kind of financial and economic, right? It's interest rates, it's trucking or insurance costs, it's the prospect of an economic slowdown. That's not really anything that AI could do anything about at this point, right? We're not at a place where it, you know that AI can kind of prevent a recession or or um, or drive down interest rates or inflation. But basically, everything else is is pretty interesting to think about in the context of of technologies like AI, right? So the next three big concerns are labor costs, labor quality, labor supply. We already talked a lot about just now about kind of the potential workforce Im- impacts there, but also stuff like you know material costs and supply chain delays permitting and inspection delays, um, you know, education and training, regulations, policy impacts. And so as I was digging around trying to understand where construction workers are using AI, it, it touches on a lot of that. And, and I think, you know, we'll spend some time kind of digging into some of those more specific applications. But, you know, AI to, again, help to offset some of those labor shortages by by making making workers safer, making workers more productive, especially at the back office level, you know, expediting things like compliance reviews and things like that, helping with, you know, optimizing kind of supply chain and purchasing decisions in a, in a really uncertain supply chain environment. Again, using AI to kind of process massive amounts of data and help make those decisions or, you know, helping to create more realistic schedules and, and, um, and cost estimations based on past project results and things like that to kind of reduce the friction and the delays and the the unexpected costs that would come later on in the process. So a lot of ways that AI can help construction firms across the industry. But on the flip side, you know, when you look at kind of how much it's actually being used, it's still a pretty small portion of the industry of, of the construction sector that's actually using this stuff. So in the same kind of survey that I looked at, there was actually a question on how many construction firms are using AI have made investments in AI and about 70% have made no investments per this survey data, right? 70% haven't done it at all. 19% have kind of made their first initial kind of pilot scale investments. And then another 11% are maybe at the next step, they're kind of, they're stepping up their investments. They've maybe made it beyond the first kind of initial pilot stages. So the dichotomy here, or the, the case here, you know, being that there's a lot of opportunities for construction firms and construction workers to benefit from this technology, but the vast majority of construction firms are not yet using it. Now, I will say one of the points that was kind of the observations that was made when I gave this at Nuka, actually by the same guy who had <laughs> written the the love poem to his wife, um, he, he was a talkative guy, but he mentioned that, you know, that part of that may just be the fact that of those 70% of firms that aren't using AI, they may just not even realize it yet, right? They, they, may, be, they may be using technology and they may be using software that has some sort of a basis in, in AI and artificial intelligence, and they don't even realize that or they're not aware, or maybe somebody in their organization is kind of playing with it, but, but it's not like a company-wide initiative. So I think that's a really interesting angle and I think would probably be pretty translatable to the utility sector as well, where if you go out and ask a bunch of utility managers or, or you know, executives or CEOs, they may say, no, we're not, we're not doing that, but there may actually be somebody somewhere in the organization that is, or they've, they've invested in some software platform that has some kind of underpinnings in AI that, that they just don't realize. Right. So, so that's an interesting point, but the the last you know kind of getting into the reasons for this and i think this is really where a lot of what my kind of talk was focused on was so okay we we see that there's a lot of potential for ai within the construction industry but most firms aren't using it or at least you know not in any kind of meaningful scale so the question is why what what are the barriers to adoption and this is where i found actually some pretty interesting deloitte research on not in construction specifically but just kind of across the economy just top barriers to AI adoption from like global global CEOs, a survey of global CEOs. And the big barriers are not really related to cost in any way. It's it's all kind of about, it's all basically knowledge and information gaps, right? The biggest barrier is just identifying use cases, right? It's it's business leaders not really, you know, maybe being aware of this technology, but not really understanding 
how they can use it or what's the appropriate place to use it or, or where to start trying it out. But it's also things like, you know, just overall digital maturity or capabilities or lack of, of data, just kind of, again, not having the in-house capabilities, the in-house expertise, the in-house kind of data to support any kind of scalable AI investments or strategy. And so that was really kind of an interesting observation that I also, I think would also be pretty well translatable to water utilities um, more specifically, or to construction firms more specifically, is that, you know, the, the big challenge here is that people know it's out there, they just don't really know what to do with it, or, or how to make good use of it. And that's really where I was trying to kind of focus the 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 presentation. Yeah, I think it's really, I mean, it's simply like, what is the definition of it? And what does it mean? And what are the applications? Because it, it, artificial intelligence is a sort of umbrella term. And I think the other thing that was interesting, and I agree with, I mean, it got to 1 million users in five days because ChatGPT was super accessible, right? It's free. You can go on, you choose it, you use it, you poke around. I mean, I did the same thing. I was probably one of those 1 million people. So with that being the case, it, it is now, I suspect, now with not just ChatGPT, but other, Claude is another one, depending on your organization or just depending on your interest. There are a number of AI tools out there that are accessible to all of us. But you also see like LinkedIn even says, hey, we have artificial intelligence. Can we help you write your posts? They do all these things. So I think it's really interesting. It is out there and whether the, there's a, true difference between whether it's been formally introduced and is being managed within a company or organization versus not, or is it more free form, more ad hoc among the employee base. But so when you look, let's sort of maybe quickly go through some of the applications that where you see some companies using AI and do you have any potential business outcomes for AI in the construction sector? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so this was this was kind of fun for me because I mean, to your point, you know, being one of the early users of like you said, you know, using Chat GPT in the first couple of days, I actually haven't done much with it, but I figured this was a great chance to 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 work with it. I mean, you know, part of my kind of day job at Bluefield is really understanding really well the the water utility technology and software landscape. And so I could very easily you know, kind of list off a bunch of names of startups that are doing this stuff in the in the utility space, but I hadn't really looked at it from the perspective of the construction industry, right? Like software firms and startups and AI companies that are selling into general contractors and construction firms. So I thought, well, what's a better, you know, what better place to start than using ChatGPT to come up with some lists of names of like some of the some of the big possible use cases and then who's actually doing that or who who's kind of developing solutions for that. And, you know, I think it was a pretty telling experience you know we we actually one of our colleagues was just talking to a sewer based ai company a couple of weeks ago that does basically cctv inspection um you know using kind of machine learning on, or machine vision on on that footage and um the remarks from from you know from her from the ceo of the company was basically like this is kind of like a kind of like an like an intern right it's it's something that can save you a ton of time but it's not going to be 100% right all the time you do still need some sort of checks and balances and and kind of reviews and and QA QC in place and so that was really what i found here you know i, I asked it to give me a bunch of company names and maybe 50% of them were were pretty spot on and others either had gone out of business since, you know, basically ChatGPT, the free version of it, at least the information is only good up until about 2022, because that's when the training was done. So anything that's happened after that, it's not going to know about. So, you know, companies went out of business or companies got bought by somebody else, or they were, you know, rebranded, renamed, or they just did AI, but not at all in the construction industry, like nothing to do with construction. So kind of an interesting thought experiment for me in terms of how useful this this is for market research, at least. But but I did come up with some pretty good names and some pretty good um, examples of, of applications. And, you know, like I said, a lot of it is in the kind of the pre-construction or the back office space, right? So it's, you know, using AI to optimize the design process. There is actually a cool company that you can basically like, it's kind of like a chat GPT, but for designing buildings, <laughs> you can kind of tell it what you're looking for. You can like type out, I'm, I want to, I'm going to build a building that has these characteristics and, and it'll like make models for you, right? It'll, it'll do kind of design preliminary designs of, of what that, that building could be and, and help kind of uh, expedite that process. There's a lot of stuff, as I kind of mentioned earlier, for um, you know reviewing past project data and kind of current environment, you know, uh, current economic environmental conditions to say what is an optimized or, or realistic cost estimation for this project or scheduling right for this project. 
a lot of it comes down to basically document review, right? So kind of feeding complex legal documents into an AI platform and then basically being able to ask questions of your PDFs, right? If you've got, you know, a couple hundred page legal documents or contract documents and you want to say, what are the main provisions of this contract? What are my major risks here uh, my and my liabilities here? Does my design for this project meet local code and compliance kind of standards and things like that? Being able to use technology to, to help with that that really kind of manual document review and document management, I thought was super interesting. Um, and then you get into the construction side of it, which there's a lot of really interesting stuff too. I mean, I know I said earlier, right, that more of the potential exposure is on the back office side of things, but there are some pretty cool technologies that are, you know, maybe not necessarily offsetting construction workers, you know, core duties, but 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 are kind of helping with things like efficiency and productivity and, and really safety was the big one, right? So there's some companies out there that do things like basically processing, kind of monitoring video footage from a construction site and uh, checking to see, you know, is 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 everybody wearing a hard hat? And if not, you know, send an alert to the to the foreman or to the supervisor so that they can, you know, come in and, and fix that. Or um, I've I've even heard about things like, you know, tracking people's eye activity, like people behind, you know, the 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 wheel of a bulldozer, for example, or some sort of a vehicle, tracking their kind of eye activity to make sure that they're they're not falling asleep, right, and and stuff like that. So just really interesting applications that are, you know, again, that's not going to take over for a construction worker, but it is going to potentially make them safer and prevent accidents and prevent injuries and, and, you know, liability and lawsuits and that kind of thing. There is a little still, you know, a little bit of, of, of uh, activity out there that's actually, you know, kind of like robotics infused with construct or with AI, I should say. So, you know, probably a lot of people have seen that, you know, Boston Dynamics, that company that makes um, pretty, you know, kind of advanced robots, right. And, and they have this, little robot dog that can kind of run around a job site and do basic, you know, collect like surveying data and that kind of thing. Um, and there were some interest, you know, cases, interesting examples of like autonomous bulldozers or autonomous uh, pile drivers and things like that. So, you know, we are getting to that point as well. I think that's definitely far, far uh, earlier stage than, you know, some of the stuff that we're seeing in terms of the back office applications and, and the other piece that I've talked about, but that is out there too. And it's really interesting to kind of watch uh, how that unfolds. In terms of the outcomes, this was another, you know, interesting question is, okay, so there's all this cool technology, what can be done with it? And so, you know, again, looking through some, some work from, you know, companies like Deloitte, for example, um, some of the estimates that I saw range from, you know, in terms of kind of 10 to 20% reduction in budget or timeline uh, deviations from, you know, uh, over the course of the project, savings on engineering time spent or engineering hours of like 10 to 30%. And then total project cost savings of ten to fifteen percent, right? So, so pretty significant numbers, especially, you know, in a in a pretty tight margin occupation or tight margin industry that that I think would be really meaningful for a lot of companies. The other piece of it that we haven't talked about in in terms of outcomes and and opportunities that I think you know it was just kind of one slide that I that I threw in randomly in the presentation because I thought it was important. But and this is something we've talked about quite a bit. The other side of it being for all of this AI to function, there needs to be a lot of data centers out there, right? A lot of data processing centers uh, and 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 all of the construction that we're seeing going into that space, right? I mean, just looking at the US kind of US facility count data, there's been about a 15% compound annual growth rate from 2015 through 2023 and just a number of data centers in the US, right? There's just a tremendous surge in building activity here. And again, if you're a utility contractor, utility construction worker, there's a ton of, you know, infrastructure that's going into to building those those facilities, right? You know, the water supply for cooling, um, all of, you know, the energy supply, the um, the telecommunications connectivity uh, infrastructure that needs to go into all of that. And, and, you know, not only are there more and more of these facilities, but especially because of the AI boom, they're getting bigger and bigger. I, I just saw a um, couple weeks ago, uh, some an announcement from Oracle, right? They're building a new data center to kind of house a lot of their new AI related, um, you know, workloads. And they said you could basically fit like eight Boeing planes nose to tail in, in, in this facility. It's that big, right? So imagine again, all of the, all of the infrastructure, all of the utilities that, that are kind of part of that. Um, so, so not only is there an opportunity specifically for this audience, for kind of the utility construction audience, it's not just, uh, using this technology, but also, you know, being able to help build it, right. And, and contribute to, to that infrastructure that I think is a really, really important and kind of interesting opportunity. Well, and the water usage for those data centers, I think 
our colleague Amber's looked at this about, you know, for every thousand chat GPT searches or 50,000, you know, how much water does, does it use? I mean, it is the, the water demand from these for cooling for these data centers is immense and growing. And currently, you know, I know they're working on all kinds of solutions, everything from putting data centers, you know, submersing them in the ocean and, and, you know, cooler waters to a number of different things. So it's pretty incredible. So, well, most of our research, I mean, a lot of time you spend actually on the, the digital space that focuses on utilities rather than construction firms and general contractors. So having gone through this exercise, talked to a number of different companies at NUCA and UMC and elsewhere, I mean, do you have any perspective on similarities or applications as far as digital maturity for AI and or water wastewater? Yeah, I mean, that was interesting, for sure. This was really the first time that I've spent in kind of a dedicated, you know, event focused on the construction sector and on construction firms, not not on utilities, right. And so, you know, one of the things that struck me was just, there are, I think, a lot of similarities in the sense that the kind of contractor space is also very fragmented, right? It's very regionalized and localized, you've got a lot of small firms that are operating in specific areas, just like you've got a lot of, you know, most utilities are kind of small, municipal um, operating in a, in a particular city or a particular, you know, community, right? So, so I thought that that kind of fragmentation was really interesting. Um, and, and with that, you get a lot of the same concerns or challenges related to just broader technology adoption, right? If you're talking about a small firm, maybe a, a generally older workforce, um, there, there's maybe not as much digital maturity, there's not as much time or interest or understanding or budget for for data and digital technology and things like AI, right? So, you know, there are actually a, a number of kind of construction software firms they are exhibiting at the at the event. And they all kind of, a lot of what they were saying about the challenges that they face in terms of demand and adoption really resonated with what I hear from digital water companies that are selling to utilities, right? That, you know, there there is a there is kind of a, a barrier there to overcome in terms of of driving digital adoption in terms of kind of increasing digital maturity in this in this sector. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you know, construction firms are private companies, right? They're kind of for-profit companies. And so there is that profit motive there. And a lot of the applications really were were quite different in terms of how you're using this, this these technologies, right? I mean, basically, a lot of the utility applications are for kind of sustaining assets and operations, um, and as opposed to kind of the the construction phase, the, you know, the job site applications, really more project specific, right? So using, you know, using AI to reduce costs or improve compliance uh, for kind of a one-off project basis versus something that's going to be used to kind of, you know, maintain your operations over time, whether that be reducing your, you know, your chemical usage or improving your asset management operations and investments and things like that. So, you know, definitely some similarities in terms of the overall tech environment, but in terms of the specific types of companies and specific types of solutions, it was quite different. And I thought that was really interesting just to think about, you know, those kind of two different phases of, of infrastructure assets, right? The firms that are actually designing and building them versus the the organizations that are then managing them and operating them over the long haul and, and what that means in terms of kind of where AI can be used and and what types of uh, benefits can be kind of realized from using that technology. A lot of, a lot of kind of differences there that I hadn't really thought about. Yeah. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds, whether it be water, wastewater, but also construction industry. I mean, pretty conservative. It's not to say that there's not innovation happening, but they, you know, they need to get things done and do it well because there's potential fallout on the back end if it's not done well. You know, that's everything from building a facility and making sure it's done well to things like water quality, et cetera. So, and, you know, so AI, we haven't even gotten into cybersecurity. We can talk about that another day. I mean, this potentially even opens the door or opens a door to a bigger conversation about cybersecurity and what all of that means. So this is super interesting. I know to your point, the conference you attended was really interesting love letters and all, which I can't, get over probably won't anytime soon but uh with that being said super helpful uh before i let you go as i always ask uh what else are you working on um so as you kind of mentioned at the top we we've had a lot of a lot of great client conversations client briefings uh lately we just 
earlier today did a, a kind of a deep dive into potential implications of the U.S. election for the water sector. And, you know, I think we're going to do some something with those insights. Um, we, we were just talking about that beforehand. So definitely a really interesting, thought provoking conversation around what what some different scenarios might look like. We've also been doing some stuff, you know, pretty frequently doing different types of briefings and conversations with clients around digital water, you know, whether that be global trends, US market trends, meter market trends, whatever the case may be. So a lot, a lot going on there as far as um, working with and supporting our clients. But then on the kind of the report side, you know, working on stormwater, getting pretty close to wrapping up our, our you know, kind of first ever US stormwater infrastructure uh, market research report. So if you're a client of our US Muni service, that'll definitely be coming your way soon. Looking also at the industrial water market, you know, data centers, as well as food and bed manufacturing, semiconductor manufacturing, mining, um, oil and gas, a lot of interesting activity happening on the industrial front. And so uh, Amber Walsh, who we've mentioned a couple of times already, is working on a, a you know, kind of dedicated uh, report looking at that space. And then on the digital front, we're going to be doing a market share exercise of the top 20 global digital water players and kind of what they're doing and how they're doing it, their strategies and their kind of overall position in the market. So a lot of super interesting, super relevant stuff that, you know, clients have been asking about that we've been kind of working on for, um, for, for some time. So looking forward to getting all that out the door. Yeah, it has been busy. There's no doubt about that. So, um, you know, appreciate you jumping on for this and I appreciate the work and effort you put into not only presenting at the new York conference, but also sharing some of these insights. And I think to your point, uh, when it comes to the discussion we had today, I think we've, if we already posted or are going to post your presentation, uh, on our website. So if you are a client, you should be getting access to that, um, in due time, if you haven't already. So, well, Eric, it's Friday. Like I said, we kicked it off. This is it. This is the end almost. So uh, I hope you have a great weekend and uh, we will talk again soon. Sounds good, Reese. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. All right, man. Cheers. Take it easy. All right, there you have it. So that was awesome to have Eric join on. Uh, not going to lie, we were making some uh, jokes about uh, sometimes uh, AI isn't always correct. And is one of his points made, I think it was, as he said, a Scottish soccer team was trying to use uh, artificial intelligence to track a uh, track the soccer ball and where it was going on the field. And one of the linesmen actually w- walking up and down the line was, uh, was bald. And so the AI um, for some reason uh, focused in on the linesman with the bald head uh, rather than the soccer ball. So uh, I think uh, to Eric's point in, in while laughing was that uh, AI is not always right. So uh, keep that in mind when you, uh, write your love poem. So before we sign off, if you're in Boston, Barcelona, let us know and we'd enjoy the opportunity for a meeting. Please subscribe to Future Water Podcast and give us a review. We'll get more reviews. It's super helpful. And if you're interested in anything we talked about today, uh, from AI to election impacts on the water, wastewater infrastructure sector, um, send us a note at waterexperts at bluefieldresearch.com. And uh, also throw out a topic idea if you're interested. And lastly, tell a friend about it. This podcast and these water industry insights have been brought to you by the one and only Bluefield Research. To learn more about us, visit us at bluefieldresearch.com.